let's begin the, the webinar. Uh, I'm sorry you don't see me because I have a technical problem. So you will uh, only uh, listen to me, but I am afraid that the, the video is not working. Um, welcome you to this uh, third speaker's corner titled Preparedness or Resilience? How is, is the pandemic framed? The webinar, as you know, is sponsored by the Italian Society for Applied Anthropology in cooperation with the Department of Political and Social Sciences at the University of Catania in Italy. And I am Mara Benadusi, Professor of Anthropology at the University of Catania and also current president of the Italian Society for Applied Anthropology. Before starting, we please ask you to mute your microphones and also to turn your videos off, otherwise that worsen the quality of Zoom connection. And also uh, we, we need to recall that this meeting is being recorded and the video will be available on the Italian Society for Applied Anthropology YouTube page and website as soon as possible in a couple of days or so. Just a few words about uh, these webinars. Uh, of course, I address here mainly those of you who are participating for the first time because all the others uh, know our, our intents already well. Uh, the idea behind this uh, open air internet conversation is to revisit the Hyde Park Classical Speakers Corner in London. And our uh, main goal is to engage us in debates on topics of common interest, sharing anthropological reflections about the current pandemic and doing our best for making anthropological knowledge and applied expertise open to the public and hopefully more useful for the society at large. In, in synthesis, as anthropologists, we believe it's important to mm, practice our duty to listen listen to the current situation and to this, uh, these uncertain times, listen also to, to other colleagues and other forms of knowledge. So welcome again and good afternoon, good evening or good morning to all of you uh, for wherever you are in the world. Uh, probably those who have already participated in our webinars already know us as a team, but I will make a short presentation beneficial to the others. Together with me, Lorenzo Dorsi, Luca Rimoldi, and Irene Falconieri are the other organizers of this speaker's corner. And today is the turn of Irene that you may uh, see on the screen to make the conversation easier, collecting your request to speak and regulating questions and answers after our special guest has finished her talk. It's interesting to notice that all three of us, Sandrine Reve, Irene Falconieri and myself share a long-term interest in the anthropological study of disasters and environmental ruptures. Irene Falconieri has already carried out ethnographic research on the flood that hit Messina in 2009, and she is in the process of concluding another interesting research project on two legal proceedings in Italy, where the link between damaged environment, pollution, and criminal conspiracy is at stake. Uh, as for myself, uh, for those who, who, of you who don't know me yet, uh, I, I was studying uh, uh, in Sri Lanka after the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami. And from 2015 to 2019, I carried out a research project on the long-term effects of oil processing and land grabbing in a huge petrochemical corridor in Sicily. Together with Sandri Reve and Susan Ulberg, I am also the co-founder of DICAN, the Disaster and Crisis Anthropological Network within the European Association for Social Anthropologists. My collaboration with Sandrine is long lasting and has been really fruitful over time, at least for me. We met in, in 2009, when Sandrine had completed her PhD research on the floods swept through Venezuela in 1999. By that time, I had already returned from my first Potsunami ethnographic fieldwork in Sri Lanka. And we both had a lot to share on the issues of vulnerability, resilience, and risk related to disasters and ecological crises. And since then, we have been sharing research interests, four-handed publications, intense cooperation in workshops, conferences, 
and international meetings. In the coming months, hopefully, our intellectual friendship will be further consolidated thanks uh, to the participation in a common research project titled Ruling on Nature, Animals and the Environment Before the Court that explores how nature-related issues are brought before the law, how the environment and animal protection are handled at judicial level by lawyers, activists, and the states. In other words, how nature is judicialized as part of current ecological and ethical concerns. Uh, and this is why uh, today I, I can say that I am double honored to have Sandrine Reve here with us at the Speaker's Corner, listen to the pandemic. Uh, as you know, probably she works at Sanspo in Paris. And from 2008 to 2015, she conducted the a multi-sided ethnography on the international world of disasters. And this world uh, make her travel from the UN offices in Geneva to several Latin American countries where programs to prevent or manage disasters are implemented. Her latest book that is titled Disaster Land, an ethnography of the international disaster community analyzes the making of this global world of natural disaster by its professionals. Through a long-term ethnographic study of this uh, arena, Sandrine unveils uh, in the book the elements necessary for the construction of uh, an international uh, world for governing risk and, and upheavals. And as we will see during this webinar, uh, there are three types of uh, strategies uh, mainly collective narratives, shared languages, and standardized practices. As Sandrine will show, uh, the two main framings that disaster experts uh, use to situate themselves uh, with regard to uh, a pending event uh, are preparedness and resilience. And analyzing these two action devices, in her book she reveals how uh, uh, heterogeneous, conflicting, and often competing elements are put together in promoting this disaster risk reduction agenda worldwide, and their effects also in the long term. And today, this interesting ethnographic experience will be the starting point for exploring how the current pandemic is being internationally framed and what the COVID-19 emergency can tell us about our possibilities for action in response to future outbreaks. So thanks, thanks to everybody to be here and thanks again very much to Sandrine Reve who accepted to be our speaker today. Just a simple input for Sandrine before starting. In your book, Sandrine, you explain clearly what lies behind the intervention logics that emphasize preparation and resilience in response to disasters. Uh, so, if we apply this focus to the current pandemic, what are the main narratives, the main languages and action devices that make the COVID-19 a global event, let's say a global social situation? How can anthropology of disaster help us to better understand the COVID-19 global emergency? And finally, what are, in your view, the main applied lessons that as anthropologists we can learn from this current pandemic? That's it. Sandrine, let's start. Thank you again. Thanks to all Thank of you. You. <clears throat> uh, you can listen to me? Very well. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mara, Lorenzo, Luca, Irene, for uh, the invitation and the organization of the event. Uh, for me, it's a great pleasure and, and a great honor to uh, be there after two eminent anthropologists, uh, Frédéric Keck and uh, Andrew Lakoff. Um, and I'm very pleased. I see many known faces or names, at least, because we, we see small black uh, black uh, squares, but I see that uh, there's a lot of known people and I, I want to, to say hello to everybody and thanks to be there. I'm very happy to share with you some of the thoughts. Uh, the first thing I uh, want to say is that, uh, unfortunately, I, I will read my paper because it's in English and I have uh, more difficulty to, imp to improvise in English. I'll try to make it uh, living and not uh, boring, uh, but uh, I, I have to, to go through this uh, little help. 
The second thing I wanted to say is that I'm not at all a specialist, like unlike the two previous uh, speakers that were a specialist, I'm not a specialist of health emergencies. Um, since, like Mara said, I've been working for the last 20 years on, on so-called natural uh, disasters in an anthropological perspective. Uh, it's not to say that this uh, virus uh, is not natural or has been invented or created by man. It's, it's not my purpose, but it's that the health emergencies imply a whole a different world of practices and professional and narrative that are not the same than the ones that work on, on natural disasters that I've been studying. However, uh, I accepted to be there because I really think we can make parallels that can be maybe helpful in order to think the actual moment. And I, I was very glad to, to answer positively to the invitation of Mara and the uh, uh, Italian Society for Applied Anthropology. So I, I, I propose to open up this discussion uh, because I, I will not speak too long. I will speak like half an hour. Uh, I think the, the most important part can be in the, the exchange and the dialogue with you. Uh, but I propose to open up this discussion with, with two points of reflection. Uh, the first one is based on what anthropology of disasters can offer as tools in order to analyze uh, events and processes like uh, the one we are living now. And the second one, and I'll try to, to answer uh, Mara, Mara's questions or invitation. Um, I will use my last book, uh, Disaster Land, uh, to think about the importance of framing within disaster management uh, professional or society uh, in, in, in general. In brief, uh, the idea is to, to think uh, how the way disasters are framed have an impact on the way we understand them and the way we deal with them. So uh, starting with the, the first point, uh, I wanted to share is uh, the, the possible role of anthropology in lighting the actual disaster. Um, so I will come back on the way anthropology has been working on, on disasters for, for decades. And I will try to see how these uh, points have been visible and relevant during this disaster. Um, so even if the scale of these pandemics is uh, unprecedented, anthropology of disaster has for a long time uh, worked on similar situations. Anthropology cannot make sense of what is occurring, but it allows us to examine uh, how humans deal with it and give meaning to uh, what they are going through. So several themes uh, that have been widely dealt with uh, in the anthropological literature appear to be relevant in the current situation. The first one is that the anthropology of disaster has shown for a long time now that contrary to what we recently heard, um, disaster do not even out inequalities, but on the contrary, that they deepen them and worsen them. Uh, in the face of a discourse that emerged in the 1980s and 1990s around the idea of global risk and in particular with the publication of Risk Society of Ulrich Beck that claimed that contemporary risk um, have a common characteristic of uniting humanity under the same condition of vulnerability. Anthropology in the country has shown that such vulnerability differs depending on the context leading people to deal with situation of danger with very different resources. In the COVID-19 disaster, it has been very obvious that even though everyone, almost everyone in the world, was threatened, we weren't equal in the face of the threat. Uh, and we weren't, of course, equal in the face of the measures taken to fight the pandemics. To be locked down in France, or in Colombia is not the same. To be locked down in France in a small apartment or a big country house is not the same. And in Colombia, to be locked down in Bogota or in the marginalized Choco department is very different. But what the disaster situation reveals here, in fact, is something very usual. You know, it's the normal condition of inequalities 
that organize our world. Normal in the sense that usual, routine, not extraordinary in the sense of the, 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 the event or the disaster taken as, a, as an ex exception. So the disaster in this case, uh, as in many others, plays the roles of a prism that magnifies the characteristics, the characteristics of our societies. I was struck, for instance, in France uh, by the reaction of the housing minister during the lockdown. You know, he was saying on TV that it was intolerable uh, to, uh, for the people to be locked down, eight people in 32 uh, square meters. But I was thinking, is it just tolerable to leave eight people in 32 square meters? Uh, and the disaster was just playing the role of, of a magnifying glass that allowed them to see better routine problems such as uh, domestic violence or poor housing condition and many other social problems. To go on with what anthropology can tell us about this kind of events, I would like to recall that by coming as close as possible to the people and the group they study, anthropologists are also able to see the unexpected resources some groups considered to be vulnerable can mobilize. Groups that have developed skills to deal with critical situations on an everyday basis and that are sometimes less destabilized than others when a disaster appears. I was talking to one of my contacts in Chocó, Colombia, a few days ago, and he was telling me about the situation there where, with the COVID. Although the spread of cases remains for the moment relatively low compared to other, more urban and better connected regions of the country, the situation there is particularly worrisome because of a completely non-existent health system. This friend said to me on the phone, we are used to, to dealing with the health care system. We rely on our traditional resources and make the traditional health care system work. This is not an exceptional situation for us. Of course, that does not mean that it is easier to have an epidemic like this in a place without a healthcare system. But it does mean that the anthropologist is able to capture the resources that people can count on based on the situation in which they are living. To ignore the, these resources is to ignore around the world, live their daily lives. Anthropology, disaster anthropology, has also shed light on the emergence during critical situation of survival communities based on the social organization of groups that allow for emer emergency reorganization. This is what we have seen during the lockdown <clears throat> in many places through the phenomena of mutual aid between inhabitants of the same building or neighborhood or within family groups. And it is also what is reflected in the impulses of solidarity that reinsure us about the human qualities that arise in critical, critical time. However, anthropology has also shown um, that such solidarity is ephemeral and that it is undermined as soon as external aid mechanisms take over, based on selective criteria that reintroduce differences and competition between those who have access to them and those who don't. On the other hand, disaster situations often, often make it possible for new actors and new social relations to emerge. Gender relations can be disrupted, as can relations between generations, and new leader leaderships may emerge. Once again, these processes are not universal, but they need to be studied in specific contexts with a perspective that goes beyond the very moment of the crisis and with a good knowledge of the field, which is what anthropology can bring. Usually we know the field before a disaster appears and we can study what is happening in this critical moment because we have this long experience of the field and the, the, the society. In disaster situation, uh, anthropology has also shown that emblematic figures 
uh, also frequently emerge um, heroes, victims, scapegoats, and they can be portrayed very differently depending on the context. Uh, for instance, in France, as in other European countries, Health workers have been qualified as heroes, both by the government, the medias, and part of the population. And new collective rituals have been realized in order to recognize and thank them as applause from balconies and windows every night at 8 p.m. This ritual, widely spread all around the world, has been the subject of a multitude of adaptation and interpretation discussion and even disagreement. In France, for instance, part of the nurses and health workers were publicly refusing this ritual, affirming there were no heroes, uh, but they wanted to be able to realize their job normally. In some contexts, health workers have been in the country treated as scapegoats. And we, we have seen, all seen on social medias, uh, very violent scenes of people trying to evict nurses or doctors from their buildings, fearing the contamination. Anthropology has a lot of work analyzing the different dynamics of scapegoating in times of disaster. Um, the stigmatization of Asiatic population in France, at least at the beginning of the epidemics, uh, has been very strong even in schools where Asiatic looking kids were sometimes rejected by their friends. In other contexts, such as uh, Colombia, for instance, the division of the name, the age, and the, uh, the identity of some of the persons infected by the virus on social medias led to their harassment through uh, social networks or, or by their neighbors. What appear here, is that there is no universal figure of victim during a disaster such as the one we are experiencing now. People affected by the pandemic can be seen as victim in one context, as dangerous in another, or even criminalized by some of the surveillance devices used by different governments in order to trace their movement if they do not respect the security instructions. Here again, we see the importance of anthropology, which offers the possibility of studying these phenomena on the long term and with a good knowledge of the context and the society where they occur. Another thematic that has been extensively documented by anthropology of disaster is the impact that the treatment of corpses can have in disaster situation, be it epidemics, natural disaster, or other situation of mass deaths, such as conflict. It has been shown that non-compliance with funeral rituals, mass burials, and degrading treatment of bodies have a major influence on how society deal with the dead in the longer term. Here again, the COVID-19 disaster, different problems are appearing in different countries and contexts that will certainly have long-term effects. How will the mourning be possible in places where funerals have been banned and families have been impeded to assist to the burial of, of their beloved? How each society will commemorate their death? In Spain, recently, 10 days of national grief have been declared in order to commemorate the death of the pandemics. Other countries have chosen other form of collective mourning, but we'll have to observe in the next years how more discreet and local rituals are organized and how people deal with this mass death. Finally, anthropology makes it possible to work on the basis of the different narratives that are produced about an event, which can take forms as diverse as songs, piece of art, poems, tales, and stories, pictures, and everyday conversations. And that can provide insight on the meaning that people give to such events. Without limiting ourselves to media narratives or national discourses produced by a few emblematic figures, it is interesting to analyze the complexity of these narratives and to see that they weave 
in several voices the fabric of a collective narrative that does not always stabilize. Uh, it's a dynamic, it goes on. Uh, these narratives attempt to give meaning to what has happened or is happening and often point to the culprits. What is striking when one analyzes them in detail is the plurality of voices that coexist within them. So in short, I, I would say that what is specific to anthropology is the way it enables us to look and, as Mary was saying at the, the beginning, to listen um, at the ordinary of this extraordinary situation by exam examining everyday experiencing Ethnography offers a particular scale of inquiry and engages with detailed description, while anthropology offers a comparative program that offers a wider perspective. And I think it's a good tool for us to understand this, this kind of event. <clears throat> the second point um, I wanted to address is the way in which we think and talk about what is happening and what this tells us about the means that are deployed to deal with the situation. Uh, it's the framing part, which is uh, at the center of my book. Let's consider UN agencies, for instance. Uh, the international coordination concerning pandemics is managed by the World Health Organization and by the United Nations Office for the, of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA. For these agencies, the COVID-19 situation has been, from February on, considered a public health emergency of international concern. In France, as uh, in many other countries, European countries, I think, the frame was, is still here, is similarly that of the health crisis, in crise sanitaire in French. And uh, for me, such wording bears two risks. <clears throat> the first one stems uh, from the decision to talk about a crisis or an emergency and to use the vocabulary that goes with it. The notion of crisis implies a normal state and its temporary disruption before a return to normalcy, to, to normal. The crisis translates graphically through the metaphor of the peak. And we have all waited for the peak to be reached and for the wave to submerge us, uh, as well as curves that rise and come back to their original level, more or less rapidly. It is a very linear reading of the crisis. In addition to this, talking about a crisis implies that the structure is only affected temporarily. In the current situation, however, it is obvious that this pandemic is not an abnormal disruption of a normal functioning but rather one of the normal consequences of an abnormal functioning. The current situation will also trigger a shock for existing social structure, which therefore means that it corresponds better to the notion of disaster, which designates a transformative event that destroys, reverses, upsets the order that precedes, precedes it. The second risk I see in the widespread use of the notion of health crisis is related to the, the qualifying term health. By qualifying the event in this way, we focus on the hazard itself, the virus. We risk <clears throat> uh, prioritizing the framework of health or sanitary dimension over all other. But as political sociology has shown in the past, one of the effects of this crisis is to overwhelm the usual organization of the society into sectors. To produce what Michel Degree has called desectorization and obliges us to think outside of our usual comfort zone. This forces to focus on coordination, which constitutes a major challenge for risk management professionals 
and is one of the most complex operation to put into place in the sense that each professional world, each sector has its own temporality, its own challenges, its own languages, its own aims and scales of action. So making all of these coincide is an extremely complicated undertaking. I do not pretend denying the specificity of this event or the central role played by the healthcare system in its management, of course, but I think circumscribing it through using the term health crisis eclipses totally all the domains that are and will be affected in the long run and also implies that in everyday decision, health takes precedence over everything else. But of course, we see and we have seen this was not the case and this isn't the case. The health, social, environmental, economical and political dimension of this disaster are entangled with one another and they need to be considered together. Uh, in, in my book, in my last ethnographic uh, study of disaster risk uh, reduction professionals, which concluded in, in, in this book, Disaster Land, that I can't even show you because I, thanks to the pandemic, I didn't receive it. It's, it's out, but I don't have it. <laughs> um, um, this study has helped me to think about uh, these dynamics. Uh, in this book, I, I examine um, how an international world of disaster risk reduction has been shaped from uh, forging a common myth on various narratives to its mode of legitimation, from the production of images and, and a common iconography uh, to common data and to the creation of a common language. Uh, the book analyzed how in the international world of disaster, professionals give meanings to what they do. To do so, they combine representations of disaster and frameworks for action into as many available resources. Every combination forges an image of what is a disaster and what should be done to diminish its impact. And the making of this common world disaster land uh, is the negotiation friction between these different representation of disaster, of temporality, of what should be done, uh, depending on, on the actors. Uh, in the international world of natural disasters, professional, two major framing, uh, two major ways of understanding and dealing with disaster monopolize the stage the framing of preparedness and the resilience framing. The issue of preparedness uh, has been long discussed in the two speakers' corner, both by Andrew Lakoff and Frédéric Keck. I will not develop too long on this idea and its history that goes back during the Second World War with the setting up of the first institutions of uh, civil defense and continued uh, to be developed in the United States, in particular during the Cold War through a set of mechanisms to deal with a pot potential nuclear attack. Uh, preparedness is based on the idea that the disaster is inevitable, that it can occur at any time, and that it is therefore necessary to be prepared in order to limit its impact. The question is no longer if the disaster will occur, which would be more the thinking of prevention, uh, or when uh, it will occur, which would be more uh, prob probability thinking, but what will be done once it does occur. Preparedness is based on a set of measures and dispositives, devices such as early warning systems, exercise, simulations, storage, coordination plans, and on a relatively short time frame for action. It highly relies on emergency, technology, hierarchical command, and a hazard-centered vision of the crisis. Hazard in the sense of the phenomena itself, which can be a, an earthquake, a flood, a virus. Um, 
focusing on preparedness, like it has been the case during the actual pandemics in most countries, tends to hide other ways of thinking about what is occurring, other frameworks that are based on less visible actions and that consider the long term. For example, framing an event in terms of vulnerability or resilience rather than preparedness doesn't only center on the hazard, here the virus, and on an exogenous representation of the disaster, it means seeing like being outside the society and we have to fight again against something attacking the society, but on the contrary, adopts an endogenous vision of the disaster. That means seeing it as a, prod as a product of a society. It sees the disaster not as a rupture of a normal order of things, but the normal consequence of an abnormal order of things. Even if um, in a majority of contexts, we have been, what have been predominant in the management of the COVID-19 disaster is the preparedness framework focused in the vertical, hierarchical and centralized management with a vision focalized on the hazard and on the short temporality of the emergency with a high reliance on expertise and technology. What we also witnessed in many situations has been the decline of health systems, of health technology, and the low capacity of expertise to correctly guide political decision in such an uncertain context. And we assisted to the glorification of resilience of individuals and some small groups to face alone the disaster. When framed in terms of resilience, a concept which has a long story of uh, coming from ecology and going back through psychology and a, a lot of uh, multiple sources of uh, inspiration, the disaster is considered to be a shock impacting an environment or system, a trauma that must be recovered from by societies that must be educated, as uh, Mara Benadusi has shown, educated to be uh, resilient. The idea is to bounce back after the shock. The time frame of the resilience framing fits into a cyclical perspective that considers the disaster as a moment in the life of a society, followed by a phase, a phase of recovery, reconstruction, and finally preparation for the next disaster. So there have been a lot of discussion about the concept of, of resilience, if the idea is a cycle of it should be like, like this, like we should be learning from the disaster and to be more resilient and to advance. I will not enter into this uh, um, theoretical uh, 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 discussion, um, but what is interest me is what is done in the name of, of uh, resilience. Um, so, in the perspective of resili resilience, disasters are thought as events that stem from factors that are internal, endogenous to the society itself. And as, the, the, as a result, the resources to face them should be found within that, that society or group, often at a local sc scale and even among individuals. In my book, I've been observing the type of things, programs or projects people in the world of disaster risk prediction actually do in the name of uh, resilience. These actions are primarily characterized by the fact that they put in expertise, the expertise in the hands of local actors. And even that they put sometimes the responsibility in the hands of individuals. The technologies mobilized are most of the time low cost, so that it can be implemented locally by the population themselves. In this sense, during the COVID-19 disaster, we assisted in Europe, but even more in some other region of the world where the state is proper, properly inexistent in its social dimension at least, to many local initiatives of solidarity, 
of low-tech solutions such as the making of masks and other sanitary protection equipment at home by volunteers, the delivery of meals to homeless people by voluntary citizens, women in their majority cooking at home, self-help practices for the elderly and homeschool organized by parents, women again paying a hard professional tribute to the crisis management. But we also assisted to the emergence of an inv ind individual responsibility discourse. Protect yourself and protect the others. To the valorization of common sense in the face of increasingly inaudible public speeches, of education to responsibility, etc. All this is very representative of the resilience framework. And the valorization, I could say, the glorification of these practices, both by the media and by the authorities, reveals, to my point of view, both the weakness of the high-tech, centralized, expert preparedness model that was dominating the public decision and public discourse, and the complementarity more than the opposition of preparedness and resilience framework, which I also, I also observe in, in, in the, the world of disaster risk prediction professionals. If we are not prepared, then we'll have to learn how to be resilient. If the public system, the state, the economy, the political actors are not prepared, then the neighbors, the families, the village, the community, will have to be resilient. We can observe the shift in scale from state to individuals, a shift in temporalities from emergency to long-term, a shift in tools from high-tech to low-tech. Before I conclude, I uh, wanted to put the emphasis on another way of framing uh, the uh, disasters that, at least in France, has appeared slowly not really in the management of the disaster itself, but in the analysis that some critical uh, medias and researchers have been able to make of it. It's the vulnerability framework, which emphasizes on factors of vulnerability and considers the structural measures as part of a temporality that goes beyond the emergency of crisis management, beyond in the sense of long before and long after, and implies a need for public policies aimed at reducing these factors of vulnerability. By shifting the focus uh, away from the hazard, the vulnerability framing has the great advantage of unveiling the structural deficiency of our social systems. And addressing these deficiencies is, to my point of view, the only way to be able to address any kind of future disasters, be them natural, technological, sanitary, all this distinction not making any sense in a time where it has been demonstrated that human activity has an impact on all areas of life on Earth. We, as anthropologists, ought to work toward clearly identifying the factors of vulnerability of each of our societies that have made this disaster and other to come possible, not only in various specific contexts, but also at the global scale. Weakness of public healthcare systems, increasing globalization of trade, deforestation, modification of the equilibrium of the living, alteration of ecosystems, delocalization of production, poor trust in political staff and poor trust in the population by political staff are some of the numerous factors of vulnerability that we could start listing. But there are also many other factors that have to be unveiled in every society and every region of the world. So to conclude, I think anthropology has a great role to play since it can help us understand how different societies have managed such a global disaster or are managing because there are a lot of Latin, uh, um, uh, Latin American country actually managing a very uh, important crisis now and render visible small scale dynamics and processes and the way they connect at a global scale. 
what anthropology of disaster offers is a very rich of a long experience and tools that they are very useful. It has now a great responsibility in making the most of its experience and identify the vulnerabilities of our world through the local observation of our society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandrine. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> At least you hear me. And uh, yes, it's, it's really interesting and I thank, I thank you for uh, your thoughts and uh, for your, uh, also the arguments on the table. Uh, there are several things that I would like to comment on. Uh, but I will uh, uh, ask you only uh, a single question before giving to Irene and to all the other listeners the floor. Uh, I, I really agree uh, and easily agree that uh, anthropologists in general and also in particular uh, disaster anthropologists have never had more to contribute to an unfolding international process than during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, however, alongside disorientation, fear, and, uh, uh, and the collapse of basic forms of social protection uh, from the state, uh, new opportunities, as you were uh, saying, are also making their way into practice and discourse. Uh, and this help us to rethink our health, education, and ecological systems, testing new, new potential arrangements, and, and I would say uh, also refreshing a global uh, hierarchy of values. Uh, in shaping and stabilizing this new uh, society at, uh, of pandemic response, however, uh, we also observe a, a multitude of disparate views and positions that, that make un unity difficult to grasp. I indeed, civil servants and, and experts and volunteers military personnel, civil society organization, national and, and, and local institutions represent the current health crisis and socialize it and materialize the crisis on the ground and in the media in very different ways as you recounted. Beyond process of sharing those and stabilization, what I see uh, at least in this phase is a chaotic effort of mobilization with very low, fragile, symbolic cement, to take your expression from the book, and thus uh, still open to, to a pl plurality of interpretations and Im implementations, often colliding and highly controversial. Uh, in this sense, if we take your understanding of the international world of disaster risk reduction as a model, to imagine possible ethnographic projects directed toward the study of this in-progress global framework for pandemic risk reduction, what suggestion can you give to anthropologists interested in taking this research path forward? What could be the move to render this global heterogeneous and highly politicized world of pandemic anthropologically intelligible? Uh, Sandrine, uh, I, I will suggest to start reacting to this first input uh, while uh, Irene will collect the participants' request to contribute mm -hmm. to the debate with comments and questions. And let's just remember to all of you that if you want to speak, you have to write a private message to Irene Falconieri in this room through the chat facility, and she then will call you when it's your turn to speak. Uh, please also remember to unmute your microphones and turn your videos on only when you have the floor. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Mara, for, for this, uh, for this um, question. Um, you know, when I started to study uh, uh, in 2008 uh, the world of uh, disaster risk reduction professional, and um, I started to assist to global events and to interview people and to observe uh, scenes. What appeared to me at the first uh, moment, uh, the first uh, years, was something without real uh, homogeneity and without co cohesion. Uh, I, I couldn't understand 
what this was about because some were talking to me about emergency about humanitarian affairs other were talking to me about development about uh, long-term projects about vulnerability and I, I had this feeling that they were not at all talking about uh, the same thing and it's uh, by uh, spending many time long time uh, at different scale with all these professionals that I started to understand that they had make, made the effort with a lot of difficulties, with a lot of dispute, with a lot of frictions to build something together. Uh, something that could be seen from outside as very superficial because the, 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 the level of uh, of uh, accord uh, the, of, of 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 agreement between them were so low that sometimes it could seem so you know uh, impossible. But I realized uh, that they had been they had built something. They had built a language, a common language with a lot of friction, a lot of dispute. They still have, but they are building a language, they are building rituals, they are building uh, 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 definitions, and on the, the, you know, like Anad Singh shown, shown, shown us, a common world doesn't build on, on, on common things, but on, on frictions and on dispute and on... Uh, so I think uh, now uh, what we have seen uh, during this crisis is the exact uh, illustration of these frictions, um, which are certainly on different bases than the one I have observed in the disaster risk reduction community, but because the terms, because we have uh, actors that are not in the disaster risk uh, community, like epidemiologists, like uh, uh, um, a lot of uh, expertise that are different. But I think uh, what appeared to us is that the, the big difference is the big discrepancy between all these actors. But I think our work as anthropologists could be uh, with this long term uh, ethnography, which is our favorite tool, uh, allows to see dynamics and processes that are impossible to see in a short time. And, and we've been emerged in this world in a very short time, in two months, we had to understand what epidemiology was saying, what uh, uh, emergency staff was saying, what this doctor of this hospital was saying. So we had to understand all this and what we saw was a an, an, uh, big mess. But I think uh, these people actually make sense of what they do. And we, we could gain in, in understanding better in the long term the logics and the way they frame because um, my first analysis is very quick it's you know preparedness and resilience which are the two framework i observe but i'm sure that uh, with a long-term uh, study we would uh, uh, see much more things appear thank you sandrine You're thank you Thank you, Sandrine. Thank you, Mara. I have also a question, but I keep it uh, for later because they are uh, already four questions. Uh, the first question is from Massimo Tommasoli, uh, then uh, they are Silvia Vignato and uh, Francesca Dedrich. Massimo Tommasoli. Thank you very much, uh, Irene. Uh, I hope you can uh, hear me. Yes. And thank you, Sandrine and Mara. Uh, I, uh, I was fascinated by your presentation, uh, Sandrine. You were referring to uh, a system that uh, actually has been analyzed also in different uh, domains. Uh, you have disaster land, but I recall works on uh, aid land uh, and more recent works on uh, uh, peace land where some of the same mechanisms are at work 
uh, including uh, the uh, analysis that you carried out now on uh, framing. And actually there are intersections, uh, the world of prevention that you uh, refer to when talking about preparedness and resilience uh, is uh, of paramount importance in the, in the peace uh, work uh, in the uh, policies that are discussed at the UN. And uh, I look, I, um, I work in an international organization that deals with democracy and electoral assistance. It's called International Idea. And I work um, at, uh, in New York as an observer um, at the United Nations. So I went through the documents that were produced over the last uh, three months by the United Nations. And you can see there uh, some elements that are of interest. One is uh, that uh, there is a clear distinction between the immediate response, the, the actions that focus on immediate response and, uh, or responses, and the actions that aim at uh, recovery. And the while in the short term, what you uh, said about uh, the uh, reaction to the emergency is extremely relevant. Uh, an, an attempt at looking at the complexities of the impacts of the crisis in the recovery uh, perspective is also evident. There is also another tendency that you can see at the UN and probably in any, uh, in any administration, in any bureaucracy. And there is, uh, you recall the, 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 the concept of sector, there is a certain uh, attempt at looking at the impact of the crisis on a particular sector. Mm -hmm. So there is a policy briefing on uh, children and uh, the impact of COVID, uh, people with disabilities, um, all, um, older people, um, forthcoming other pieces on indigenous people. There is a tendency to uh, link the analysis of the crisis to a particular group, which is uh, actually related to the uh, other typical function in the world of aid, which is uh, labeling, placing a label uh, on a particular group uh, of beneficiaries that is also related to the particular field and the mandate of uh, certain institutions. So actually beyond the, the WHO, and, um, uh, and the other institutions that you mentioned uh, okay. as the first uh, responders, you have also a realignment of all the other parts of the United Nations from UNESCO to the ILO, uh, trying to look at the impact of the crisis in their particular mandates. That is also something uh, interesting and typical because we observed it also in the, in, in the past with the, maybe with different types of crisis like the financial crisis. Another element, the last element I would like to stress is that in all these discourses, there is a, an important element that everybody has to comply with, which is defining, sometimes creating a matrix to count uh, units of analysis so that they can be made sense of. And what I observed in the first phase of this crisis is that the metrics used was completely irrelevant because they were talking about things that were clearly uh, mistakenly uh, counted, like uh, people dying of COVID. Uh, these, this measure was taken in very, many, many uh, very different ways in, uh, in different countries. There were those who were counted as COVID-related deaths only if they died of COVID, and other countries that counted only those, also those who, who died with, uh, with COVID, not because of COVID. And the same uh, metrics was used uh, for uh, uh, counting the infected. So all the uh, hypotheses of action that uh, drove uh, the, the, through this vertical approach, immediate action, were based on a metric that was completely invented. 
and uh, has been actually reassessed over time several, several uh, times. So uh, what I'm asking you is, what can anthropologists say about these hun uh, hunger for statistics and a metrics to make sense of a crisis? Can we say something meaningful about the limits of these or even think of uh, innovative ways of or, or uh, new metrics in order to propose uh, uh, policy options to policymakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Irene, sh sh should I answer? Yes, okay. Thank you very much, Massimo um, Tomasoli, uh, for, for these comments, very interesting comments and, and very relevant. Uh, um, regarding my, my book, first I, I wanted to say that Peaceland and Aidland were two of my uh, references in order to, to um, choose the title of the book because really uh, I wanted to make um, globally the, the, the same uh, type of study that uh, David Moss and uh, Séverine Outser made in, in different other sectors of international organization. Um, I really agree with you and I work on, on that uh, dimension in the book about metrics. Um, and I worked on metrics before that study. I worked actually on metrics in the Venezuelan uh, context too, in order to analyze uh, what, how counting the death was um, a, a, a way um, of uh, organizing a, a, a dispute around uh, and, and stabilize the sense of the disaster. And if I come back uh, uh, in this small time, um, uh, uh, in Venezuela, uh, there has been a, 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 an over, uh, a growing number of, of deaths uh, announced. Uh, you know, people started saying 5,000 and 10,000 and 15,000 and it stabilized at the moment around 30,000. And 30,000 was the stabilized number of deaths, but nobody knew how many deaths uh, had been um, in, in Venezuela after the, 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 the landslide. But it helped people to make sense of, of what had happened. And it, it, it was a consensual number for the country, the, the national authorities, the international organization and the people themselves to help them, uh, you know, being part of a big event. Uh, in, at the international level, in, in international organization, uh, what, we, what I studied in, in disaster risk reduction um, uh, sector is that uh, numbers, uh, the metrics, uh, and the negotiation around the metrics and imposing an international metrics is uh, one of the most important uh, challenge and most important task of the professional of disaster risk reduction. Why? Because a metric is a definition of the problem. How do you count what uh, is a disaster? For example, on, on disaster uh, uh, database, international database, you can decide from what level you will enter an event. What that defines an, a, a disaster, an earthquake that makes 10 deaths should or should not enter into a database, an international database. And constructing, building an international database was one of the most important tasks of disaster land professional because it meant it meant uh, mobilizing at in every country uh, standardized way of counting deaths damages and what is a, a disaster and it meant uh, uh, um, uh, going through a same definition of, of what a disaster is and if you don't have this you have different national way of counting disaster, disaster, death, uh, uh, infected people, and you cannot speak of an international world. You can speak of international organization doing sector per, per sector. So UNICEF will count the number of uh, kids infected, uh, 
uh, and, and FAO will count uh, the number of angry people caused by the, but nobody will count the same thing. And counting the same thing is an important task in the construction, in the building, in the making of an international world. This is very important. What new metrics should be invented? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I, I, I really, I'm, I'm not specialist of, of this kind of things, but uh, I know that this is one of the tasks that professionals that want to build a common world at the international level have to go through. And it takes years and dispute. Thank you. I hope I, I answered. Thank you, Sandrine. Uh, now I give the floor to Silvia Vignato. Thank you. Silvia, are you there? You are there? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I no longer see Sandrine. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. Um, it's just a, a small questionment which goes on, which has been going on in my mind uh, since the beginning of these seminars. Um, we talk much about what anthropologists can say and can do. And I see Sandrine's point about studying the interventionist world and the professional world. But there's one thing which is impossible for anthropologists to do in this COVID is field work. Yeah. So you can't just go around and be the healthy one while the other ones are sick because you're part of the problem and that's it's framed as a pandemia so everybody says how I mean in Indonesia people tell me how how is uh, how is lockdown uh, and suddenly we are all victims or, or you name it, we can go on about that. But um, I think that there is no um, research, no possible research, uh, ethno ethnography coming from, except from hearsay or very, very um, limited personal experiences or the internet. So it's a very strange way to get a direct approach on a disease or even any kind of social phenomenon. It's probably comparable to um, war time zones, but even then you have those who go around and those who do not go, hours you can, hours you can't. So I think that uh, there's a, a big point of unethnographicable um, stuff and another big point which is made on ethnographies of reconstruction uh, and of course one of the ideas of reconstruction was always in, in Europe that after we had the war reconstructions were for the others so in Aceh I have been through reconstruction and people have an ideologies of reconstruction and of course the big mantra you build back better was everywhere and it is exactly what is being said here. We had no infrastructure and now Europe, so this new subject. So I would object, not object, but say something more to what Sandrine said, is this uh, the communitization, which is such a known project process in uh, international aid. So you say, okay, we're going to help the fishermen or the widows or the I, I dealt with orphans, so all the orphans have to be brought back to families and uh, so lots of orphans appeared which were, you can could discuss if they were orphans, surely they were in need, but, uh, and as it, the, the survival communities are always labelled in, in, in local and framed in local uh, views, but now we have macro communities like Europe and the, the comparison which is being made in reconstruction in Italy is rather, it's like the Marshall Plan, which is of course extremely stupid when there's no link between the two of them. Still, it's one big actor giving you a lot of money and some asshole not wanting to do it. 
So it's framing a new long-term perspective. Now, why is it is not possible for anthropology to step into that? I don't understand. Uh, uh, anthropologists have either withdrawn on general um, ideas, very nice, very good general ideas, but then I don't see the difference with historians, um, political scientists, they say the same things, they see the same things, they have the same eyes and the same methods. But I think it's a reconstruction and a long-term, as you said, uh, view that you can compare and make sense of what is created, because I mean, uh, societies are rooted in war, that's Hoffman's, I think, a formulation uh, about how um, a crisis does not happen in society, but makes a society. Um, yeah, so that, that was my point about linking reconstruction as part of disaster and um, community create, local community creations. I, I would like a comment, not a... Yeah, of course. Thank you. Uh, it's a, a very, very important uh, comment, I think. Uh, um, Two things. Uh, the first one uh, regarding uh, what you were saying about the impossibility of ethnography. I think this is a part uh, that anthropology of disaster has been has been uh, 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 thinking about for a long time because. Um, it's very uh, seldom that an ethnographer or an anthropologist is with witnessing a disaster on his fieldwork. It can it can occur, but uh, many of us have uh, arrived uh, after the disaster. It, either they, they knew the field before they were doing other type of, of work on this uh, field before and, and the disaster occurred and after the disaster they, they went on the field or they arrived after because they were interested in what, in what had happened uh, during this disaster. And I think uh, there's a lot of uh, written things about this, about how make the ethnography of what we didn't witness uh, through narrative, through uh, art, through uh, a, a lot of material that uh, 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 exists and, and, and in this sense you, you are right saying that we are not doing very differently from other, other social sciences I, and I'm not pretending anthropology is doing better or, or differently, it's, it's the method I practice so I'm, I'm, I'm not comparing, I'm just using my tool. So I'm not sure uh, ethnography is not possible and ethnography uh, you know, when I started my PhD on Venezuela uh, after the disaster, the landslide of 1999, I started with a project I wanted to study reconstruction uh, after uh, the disaster because that was for me the only way I could see, uh, I could see how to make ethnography. So I decided to make this and when I, uh, after many months of field work, I realized that people were partly uh, talking and, and engaged in the process of reconstruction. Of, of course, reconstruction was everywhere, building back, uh, a risk zone, and uh, a lot of tension about land and everything like this. But at the same time, people were always telling me the story of the disaster. And they were talking to me about uh, the moment for them when it started. And so they uh, invited me at the end. I didn't want to treat the moment of the disaster itself and its field work that pushed me into this direction. And I, I, I realized that the disaster and the reconstruction are not separated. It's it's one moment, and it's exactly what Oliver Smith and 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 Susan Elfman say that you know the event process, event process. It's it's not either an event or even even or either a process by themselves. A disaster is 
is large. It can, it can start uh, 500 years ago in a society and, and you can go uh, on. And disaster is, is not a, 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 a rupture or, or something like this. So um, I'm, I'm not sure um, we are not able to grasp this. I think what happens to us now, it's that we are in the middle of the, 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 the event. And um, it's not over, it's, it's just happening to us and to hold the world. So it's very difficult to think things that's, that are happening to us all at the, at the same moment. It's very different to displace you and put you uh, in, the, in the place of the, of the, the, the thinker when you are uh, strapped yourself in, in, in this situation. So I think one of the tools we have uh, is time. And we will need time, uh, definitely. I, I, I don't think we are able to think what is happening to us. I think this uh, kind of discussion helps us to propose things and discuss things, but I'm not at all uh, convinced that we are able to think now. Uh, for me, it's, it's, it's impossible, but it will be. Thank you, Sandrine. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, the, rest, the next uh, question is from uh, Francesca Dietrich. Yeah, can I, can I ask the person who is asking the question to, to leave the camera when I, I respond because I feel so alone. <laughs> see, I don't see the, uh, if the, the, the person is in contact. Can you see me? I don't see myself, so. I'm sorry, Sandrine, I didn't want to disturb the group. No, so no. I kept answering back with gestures and you and saying, yeah, of course, but I, sorry, you are right. It's okay, it's okay. But it's so much better when we can uh, interact. Of course, it was very, uh, sorry, sorry, very inconsistent. Thank you, Silvia, thank you. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Francesca? Yes, I don't know why you can't see me, but... Um, can you see me? No. No. No, Francesca, no. Uh, that was working until um, a few minutes ago. Who knows? This is how it is. Oh, however, I can uh, do it without appearing. Ah, okay, I'm appearing. Hi. Okay. Thank you very much, Sandrine. I thought that this was very interesting thought and, and, and discussion and presentation of the problems. And, um, and especially, I thought that was very interesting to see these three kind of frameworks that you highlight. Right? The one that is preparedness, and the other one is resilience. The other one is vulnerability. I I appreciate very much all the talk. So, I, but I want to go direct to the point that I was thinking. Whenever I hear vulnerability, I think in cascade all those things that we are asked to do in case of uh, war like vulnerability then you have women at the household then you have the child mother with children without husband this it's a number of different things and my question is uh, you talk about vulnerability and then when one talk about vulnerability agency often disappears like you know then you become a victim and so there's been a lot of discussion about victimization and not recognizing you know agency and activity of the actors and that is what I want you to discuss a little about because I mean I, I see that all is very interesting but whenever I hear vulnerability it just rings a bell to me and I just <laughs> start thinking about this this assistential thing for whom and then why do we assist women and whatever yeah. okay. thank you thank you for allowing me to precise in which term in which uh, sense I, I, I use this uh, this term in fact, um, I use this term uh, as my, uh, uh, as, as the professional uh, of the disaster risk reduction world uh, use, use it. Uh, uh, of course, vulnerability has a lot of meanings like resilience and, and, and it can uh, uh, lead, uh, lead uh, us to this um, lack of agency, victimization and everything. And there's a lot of literature on this. Uh, what uh, I refer I refer to the vulnerability uh, paradigm in social sciences, 
that worked on disaster with a Marxist uh, uh, framing in the 70s and that went on uh, in the 80s, uh, 90s, that imposed uh, this vision in the um, international organization in order to uh, insist on factors of vulnerability instead of uh, uh, essence of uh, vulnerability. Um, the, the purpose of this uh, literature is uh, very political and it's uh, uh, to insist on um, what are the social, political, histor historical root causes of disasters. So um, then this uh, framing, entering into international organization uh, were uh, like always uh, depoliticized and used as an epidemiological framework, uh, such as, uh, you know, target uh, population to uh, be addressed by, um, by uh, ed programs. So women, children, uh, people right. with uh, disabilities and everything like this. But uh, I refer to the vulnerability or paradigm um, as the one that, uh, that allows to uh, precise and uh, design the factors of vulnerability of a society, root right. causes. Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. Thank you, Sandrina. Um, the, the next uh, question if, if questions if, um, is from uh, Luca Rimoldi. Luca? No. So, can I ask ah. my question or do you want to collect other questions? No. Okay. No. I, okay. <laughs> Uh, merci, Sandrine, for your presentation. Uh, it was very interesting. And the title of my question could be uh, um, Humanity's War Against Nature versus Nature's War Against Humanity. I mean, uh, as you know, in Italy, as well in other Western countries, uh, depicting the response against the virus in terms of war has become very popular in these days. However, this term was uh, interrogated and criticized by several scholars and intellectuals uh, who consider this, this category a, a misleading category. So what do you think about using this metaphor uh, for the case or in the case of people, general in disasters case and in this pandemic case? Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Yes, it has been the case in France too. Um, the the war uh, we are in war. It, it was the first uh, discourse of the Emmanuel Macron, uh, the president Emmanuel Macron. He, he said it uh, six times. You know, it was uh, very commented in the in the media and in, the, in the, the society. We are in war. We are in war. So uh, I, I think um, that's why I said that the preparedness framing was was the. Uh, dominant uh, in the at least in the first uh, stage of the of the the, the disaster um, because the war framing uh, implies that the, there is a, a, a an enemy that is outside and that attack the society so considering the virus as as an external uh, uh, hazard as an external uh, enemy uh, implies a whole vertical hierarchical uh, common and control way of dealing with the disaster you know and I think it's totally wrong uh, I think uh, you know uh, Bruno Latour proposed uh, uh, in various texts um, to uh, invent uh, uh, to co, uh, uh, we we have to learn to live uh, with 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 the virus, and to uh, invent new arrangement because the virus uh, is not an enemy; it's just doing its job of virus, and is you know he has no uh, bad or, or good will. He's uh, just doing his proper life and his job. You know, so um, this leads us to um, um, how um, we have to think uh, this 
disaster in a global uh, frame. Uh, global, not in the, of course, in the sense of planetary, but also in a, a larger uh, way of, of thinking. That's why I was trying to list, uh, a tr you know, first list of factors of vulnerability. If we do not rethink our relationship with the living, with other entities, with non-humans, call them like you want, um, if we do not rethink uh, our place on Earth, um, we will encounter all these enemies, you know, all these things that just exist and that we will consider more and more like enemies, like the sun. The sun will become our enemy. And so what? We are going to uh, enter into a war with the sun? Uh, you know, it's very, it's very striking that uh, at the moment where we realize that humans are one of the major force, geolo ge geological force, we at the same time are so vulnerable that we design a small thing, such a small thing, as our enemy, you know? So uh, I think uh, we have to rethink uh, this kind of relationship, of course. I think this disaster uh is a great opportunity to to rethink that if we do not uh take this opportunity we lose everything for me it's very clear uh, it's not very positive it's a positive in the sense that it, it's an open door but uh, we have to take the train now uh, <laughs> thank you sandrine thank, thank you, you. Thank you, Luca. Uh, the first question is from uh, Marcus Oxley. Yeah. Mark? Yeah. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Can you see me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, Sandrine. Thank hi, you for hi. that. Good uh, food for thought there. Thank you. Um, look, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a disaster management practitioner. Um, but really, what I what I see myself more of really is a is a development practitioner, and and I think really the the critical issue which this needs to be framed around is ultimately around sustainability of our development, and and what I always see disasters are are just an indicator of the unsustainability of our current development pathways, but. But what I see disasters are is a uh, is our, an acute manifestation of what are chronic failings and chronic deficiencies in our in our development pathway. But it's often the case when something is acute as opposed to something which is more chronic, when something is pandemic rather than or epidemic rather than something that is endemic it's often when we stress the system that this is when we see the relative strengths and weaknesses in our system and you've 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 pulled out that you know it exposes the vulnerabilities and in actual fact it amplifies those vulnerabilities it it, it highlights our capacities and people utilize their capacities to be able to cope with this, often with very limited external support. But I think also what it does, it really exposes some of those critical interdependencies that are perhaps not so apparent in normal times. And I think one of the problems that we deal with is our system is inherently fragmented. And, you know, whether or we, you know, we separate out development from disasters and even within disasters, you know, we have this disaster cycle where we talk about preparedness and response and recovery and then longer term mitigation. That is also managed in a very fragmented, siloed way. And, and so I think one of the critical challenges that we face is the ability to develop a systems-wide perspective and a systems-wide narrative which shows what those critical interdependencies be between these different specialisms that you know as we try to deepen our understanding we often specialize and we take things apart and i understand the reason for that 
then we struggle to put it back together in a complementary, mutually reinforcing, in a you know, in a more holistic way. And and I think these crises expose that. So so I think we already have quite a strong um, approach to what's called the progression of vulnerability. If you look at the disaster pressure pressure release model, it talks about the progression of vulnerability. Um, and, and, and it provides a bit of a political impetus, if you like, to change the status quo. You know, we, we have to do something about this. It, there's often resources are released. There's an economic imperative to act. There's a moral imperative. You know, changing the status quo, actually, you know, extreme events can disrupt the status quo and they can provide this kind of leverage point, build back better, as we say. But, but I still don't think we're fully making the recognition we, we need to make of these issues. You know, you mentioned about health. And I think one thing that, that this, if we call it a public health crisis, I think perhaps what it has done, it's made people understand a stronger connection with environmental health. So people are starting to say, wow, you know, we've really noticed how the quality of our atmosphere, the quality of our air, has actually substantially improved because of this degrowth in our economy. And, and it's made people make that connection with climate issues, perhaps in a way which they hadn't realized before or hadn't fully appreciated. But I don't think we're making the connection through with planetary health. So, uh, you know, although we talk about the progression of vulnerability, we also need to talk about the progression of hazard. So, for example, we are in a period of, of where there are increasing what they call emerging infectious diseases. You know, whether it's SARS, whether it's MERS, whether it's Ebola, whether it's uh, Zika, whether it's uh, COVID-19, you know, these are symptomatic of the environmental degradation and the pressure that, that humans are putting on our environmental systems, which is pushing onto our planetary health, which ultimately hits back on human health. So I think, I think developing these more holistic understandings is critical to be able to make these, you know, understand these interdependencies. And a crisis always exposes that. Uh, and, and I think we need to capitalize on that. And also recognize the other thing, there are limits and boundaries. When we talk about resilience and we talk about adaptive cycles, adaptive capabilities, there are limits, you know. Most shocks and stresses are small scale and can be dealt with at local level, but there are some that overwhelm that capacity. And that's when perhaps the external support is, is when their capacities are overwhelmed. So, so understanding these thresholds of limits and boundaries of interdependencies are all things that perhaps come to the surface when something is acute, but perhaps isn't so apparent when things are chronic. So I, I, I'll, I'll stop there, but it's good food for thought that you raised there. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, uh, Marcus. Um, it's, uh, I, 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 I couldn't add much more. I, I agree with you and, and um, I, I'm happy that uh, you focused on inter, uh, interdependencies because I, I think this particular uh, disaster is a very good uh, uh, prism for, uh, to see and study these interdependencies. I think uh, Probably with Fukushima, maybe which was one of uh, the, the the first experience where we 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 were all connected in in a way with uh, what happened. You know, thinking about fish we were eating and and you know the air and everything like this. It's it, it, so maybe it's it's one of the one of the first. Of course, you you can cite others and before but uh, in this disaster interdependency was so visible and so strong and i think it's a it's a very important uh, uh, moment for us to 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 see that then you you were uh, saying that you didn't understand why we were uh, disaster managers were going on you know with separate um, uh, and fragmented uh, uh, narrative and, and way of, of seeing. Uh, I think uh, 
we can regret that, but we have to explain it. And you, this has a, an historical explanation. It's that, uh, you know, it's different professional worlds that come with their own history, their own practices, their own framing, their own understanding, and then all tools. And what I observed in the disaster risk reduction uh, building uh, of disaster, what I call disaster land, is you know the the the, the difficult, uh, uh, conflictive uh, put in common of this genealogy's history. Militaries coming with their idea of what is an emergency and what is efficacy. You cannot make them uh, change this history. So it, you have to go back to history to understand why it is so difficult. Um, otherwise, it's just saying, oh, we should, we should, we should do better. But I think uh, uh, we have to understand social systems and their, their plurality, their history, in order to understand how they built a common world. And um, despite all this difficulty, what I say in my book is that uh, I think Disasterland uh, built something in common. On all this friction, uh, I think um, you all <laughs> uh, uh, contributed to build something that exists and is never stabilized. It's always in, in change. And now it will change because of, of the, the actual uh, moment and the actual disaster. I think it's dynamics, you know, it's never ending. Thank you, thank you very much. The, the next question is from uh, Lorenzo Dorsi. Uh, hi, Sandri again. Um, Sandrine, uh, I mean, ethnographic investigation in post-disaster uh, context show us how uh, disasters contributed to the creation of new forms of, uh, let's say, uh, grassroots solidarity. Uh, this gra uh, grassroots solidarity are usually very limited in time, uh, let's say in a liminal time, in the I mean, Victor Turner terms, are, are directed to specific targets. Uh, I'm wondering if in all the cases that you could study and also in the current pandemic situation you could observe some of this uh, grassroots solidarity uh, with a, a much longer temporality if they are able to break out from the liminal time. I think um, in, 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 in the, the, the work I did in, uh, in Venezuela I think we have to distinguish uh, two things. And I'm not saying it's universal because I think it's very dependent of the context, the political context, the social and economical context and everything like this. But in, in Venezuela, for instance, I think we have to, to make the difference between two things. What sociology and anthropology of disaster are called these therapeutic communities, which is this very moment, short moment, uh, survival communities, we can call them, you know, it's, it's the moment when <clears throat> People have to survive, the helicopters have not arrived, they have to find for food and everything like this, or it's very short. And um, I think this moment is uh, very short and I don't know how we could analyze it in, in, in a more longer term in the COVID-19 situation. I, I, I don't know, we, need, we would need field work on that, it, uh, I could not contest uh, like this but I think it's a short moment and it's very liminal like you said and it's ephemeral and it's usually disrupted by the aid you know when uh, food arrives from the the authority or the NGO then people start to to fight and to say no you you I, I, I must uh, I have more uh, my woman my my, my my spouse is pregnant and everything like this and I try to get more this is the one thing. Then what uh, I, I saw in, in Venezuela is that um, social dynamics change uh, in a very uh, deep and profound uh, way, but that are, is not visible at the first sight. 
uh, yeah, that was I was mentioning in the terms of, uh, for instance, uh, gender relationship can change. Uh, for instance, um, women that were not leaders can become leader because in the crisis situation they uh, take they took the most because they were the one that could dialogue with uh, foreign actors and they could you know take new leadership or things like this and this can or or um, people that helped each other in the moment of the crisis can build links that uh, stay in the time uh, i saw that but I think it's very different from what uh, the literature has called survival community or therapeutic community, which is a very short moment, and which is uh, at the end very uh, used in the in the anthropology and the disaster study of the the fifties and the sixties to say that people are very well reacting to to shock and to to, and it was a discussion, you know. To the Department of State of United States that was seeing population as irrational and as uh, dangerous in time of crisis and it was a, a, a positioning of, of, of sociology also to to affirm that it's not the case uh, but I'm not sure it's it's a very it's it's very short moment and for the actual situation I, I don't know I'm, I'm I'm very bad at analyzing uh, <laughs> like this from my, my window. <laughs> thank you, Sandrine. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you, Sandrine. Um, they have another question from David Gallner. Hi, I don't know if can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sandrine. That was a wonderful, very clear paper um, which I enjoyed very much. Um, I have a sort of co comment or two-part question which I hope they're linked um, and I look forward very much to, 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 to having a look at your, at your book. Um, so I, I mean you described very well how these disaster professionals kind of create themselves as a kind of epistemic community, I don't know if you use that term, um, and, but, and I wonder if you discuss at all I mean, the, the, I imagine that the people you were talking about were very much these kind of international consultants who fly around the world and, you know, they all fly in when a disaster happens and they know each other and they start saying, oh, you remember that time when we were in, in um, you know, we were in Kosovo together and then the time before that when we were in Ukraine or whatever. And, um, and I've sort of occasionally been on the edge of these kind of discussions and sort of wondered what it would be like to be an ethnographer of these people as you are. Um, and um, but I wonder if, you've, if you talk about the people who are, if you like, the, the activists or the NGO people, the kind of the mediators who are between this mm -hmm. epistemic community and the ones on the ground who are actually, you know, who, so who are so the local NGOs. I mean, I've been very struck in, I mean, the place I know best is Nepal. I do some, a little bit of work in India as well. But, um, you know, how it, extraordinarily, you know, these things go in fashions and how people, uh, you know, at one point, all the discussion was about peace building and reconciliation and then suddenly you know that was gone the international community decided that problem was solved and all those people were out of a job and it was very interesting to see who was able to retool themselves and suddenly become experts in resilience and disaster preparedness and suddenly switch their NGOs around so they could get the new set of grants and that's, I wonder if you you know talk about those people at all and so that's the first question so the second question which is in a way is linked to that is it's very striking you know, talking about the present crisis to the those kind of local intellectuals if you like and all the political class in the developing world they are very much uh, uh, so that you know they, they're very good at retooling themselves and you know, or at least some of them are and, and 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 learning the new lingo that they need to learn in order to get the, the money to run their NGOs and, and so on or to get the, the grants for their government department, whatever it is. And we see in this disaster how, unfortunately, the kind of negative the consequence of that, certainly in, in South Asia, has been that, you know, they have very much been looking to the developed world and they've declared the lockdown at a point when there were very, very few uh, COVID cases. 
and they re because they're following Europe, they're following North America, and then they've released from the lockdown at the same time as Europe, which is precisely the point when the cases are taking off in big time. So in other words, this this ideological dominance or whatever you want to call it, or this epistemic blindness, or this kind of being locked into these paradigms of these these this, this global thing has, has actually led them into down a cul-de-sac where they've kind of ended up doing timing everything completely wrongly so that's the kind of a kind of reflection about uh, I suppose about the press trying to apply the first question to this second thing which is what you're talking about okay thank you very much because it's a uh, it's an important point of my uh, book and my study because uh, in this world um, well this world is, is full of uh, very uh, different professional uh, we have a uh, fireman uh, we have a consultant, like you said, we have uh, scientists like myself, like uh, geographers, like uh, colleagues uh, that actually uh, are um, more the part of the epistemic community. I don't use the epistemic community term to speak about the whole world because I think it was too, too you know, it was talking about expertise. I think it's the, this world, I, I use the, the, the notion of social world. Uh, because it, it helped me to see larger than the epistemic community. And of course, there are uh, these uh, in mediators that uh, I call the brokers, like in the uh, Anthropology of Development uh, references. Um, and there are two types of uh, brokers. Um, the one that make uh, the, um, the intersection between the local and the international, which is the figure of the typical NGO leader, uh, locally based, um, that is um, seen uh, in the international world as the proof uh, that the action are uh, embedded, they are, they are locally uh, wanted, and that uh, they are locally accompanied. And these people are formed to be brokers. They, they, they are formed to, to, to speak good English, for instance. They are um, taken into travels, into uh, uh, international meeting, into uh, this kind of thing in, in, in order to be able to make the contact between local and international and um, evicting the national scale. Um, you know, it's really um, important to understand that at this, uh, um, in this world, the national scale is problematic. Although uh, it's, uh, it's the whole problem because the, the international organization, they, they work with states, but uh, they spend their time uh, evicting, <laughs> evicting uh, the, the, the national scale. Uh, so they, they look for this kind of uh, brokers uh, and there, uh, the other type of uh, broker, which is the consultant type, um, which uh, or consultant or or the intermediary, which is um, national actor that can circulate between uh, national authorities, ma disaster management, and international organization. And there's a, a lot of circulation between these people, between the, in their career, uh, in their trajectory, they. Uh, go from university to national government to international organization consultant and they go back and and that's why um, they help these people they uh, construct they build the world they work in they, they are they, they build the language they build uh, the tools they contribute in the way of framing it and thinking of it and of course they uh, contribute in the circulation of the, the devices and the models. And this sent me to the second part of your question. It's, uh, you know, the lockdown as a global solution. It's a very, uh, it's a, I think we'll have a lot of work to understand uh, the spread of the lockdown of, as a global solution. Uh, without any or, or with very few thinking about the impact of the lockdown, you know, it was an evidence 
Europe started and then beep, 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 everybody did it. And you're right, you know, uh, with a temporality that is not always, that was not always good, although in some countries where the lockdown has not been put, like in Brazil, uh, they are facing very, very, very big difficulties now. Uh, although in cases in Colombia where they started the lockdown very soon, like one week after France, when there was almost no cases, it really helped to slow down the 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 the, the, the epidemics. But you know, in different contexts, the diffusion of this tool is a, a very um, uh, for me is a very was has been a very problematic uh, uh, question, and and I think we will need uh, to investigate. You know how these professional, these authorities, these uh, you know the 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 re related with the the World Health Organization, with whom how how one tool, which was an extreme tool. A desperate tool, a, a no tool at the end, <laughs> spread out in the world like this. It, for me, it's a very, very important uh, uh, question, and I have no answer. But uh, I think we should we should work on that. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Mara. Irene. Yes, Mara. Okay, now just to say uh, say something uh, because I, I, it's already uh, uh, time to 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 arrive to the end <laughs> at least of this uh, meeting, and I want to thanks again Sandrine. Uh, it was interesting also this final uh, exchange between Sandrine and David. I think that during the the global meetings uh, where uh, uh, all these disaster uh, professionals. Uh, uh, come together and uh, officialize their own languages and narratives, something that then that uh, uh, make this world even more uh, uh, legitimized. Because the, uh, the, the fact that uh, uh, all the different uh, bodies and actors are uh, co-present in the same uh, huge global meetings as such in, uh, as happened in Sendai, for instance, and from the states, to the uh, small grassroots uh, organizations that uh, attend to these uh, huge uh, conferences worldwide, organized every couple of years. Uh, uh, this fact that they are co-present and even through their disputes, they uh, forge a common language and they uh, ritualize their common practices, this help this uh, word, this uh, common uh, intervention, interventionist escape to, to be forged and to be uh, authorized to, to, to act. And I think it's very interesting the work of Sandrine because Sandrine followed these professionals and these uh, groups of different uh, stakeholders uh, uh, even in these uh, 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 huge meetings where they come together in the same place and uh, they uh, during these events, these very uh, public events, they uh, promote their own agencies, their own practices, and their own narratives. And also, they collide, they collide among each other to 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 forge uh, the trends, the dominant trends of this sector. And it's interesting. It will be interesting in the future to follow this uh, uh, process of forging and reforging the, the the disaster land after the COVID. And I agree with Andrin that we need time. We need to be. Uh, to, to, we need to follow the, the process uh, in the long term, uh, without anxiety of <laughs> being in the field uh, and doing our, our job as uh, usually. Uh, I think it's interesting uh, to, to to see that uh, the pandemic is in our uh, apartment. Uh, it's out of the window that will be out in the field uh, and we will discover all the, uh, the, the long-term effects and the uh, root causes uh, uh, when we'll be, be, be able to, to, to safely conduct our, uh, as I hope, our, our work experiences as we did in the past. Yeah. So thanks again, Sandrine. And uh, let's just recall in that the webinar has been recorded and uh, will be available on the uh, Society for Applied Anthropology YouTube page and also on our Facebook page. And I inform you also that the next webinar is planned for June 15 
uh, and our next speaker uh, will be Umberto Pellecchia from Medicine Sans Frontier and will be titled Quarantine and its Small Contents, Lessons from Ebola Epidemic. Thanks again and see you soon. See you uh, the next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sandrina. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Oops. Okay. Hey, Diego. <laughs> Bye.